I want to spend some more time looking at the determination of equilibrium constants. So here's a slightly busy slide, but uh, it'll start with a fairly simple equation. Remember that the standard state free energy of reaction at a given temperature is defined as minus RT log, and I'm going to work with the pressure equilibrium constant here, Kp, which also depends on temperature. So it's also the case that we can get the standard state free energy of reaction by definition from knowing the stoichiometry of a balanced chemical reaction and the standard state chemical potentials of all the individual species. So one can actually derive these quantities from tabulated enthalpies of formation and we've also seen tabulated entropies of formation. And so I'll refer you back to some older videos. 5.10 5 looks at free energy, excuse me, at enthalpies of formation. And 7.6 looks at entropies. So if I define a standard state free energy as being equal to standard state enthalpy minus T times standard state entropy, of formation in this case. And remember what formation means is I've just considered reactions that began from all the elements in their standard state pure forms. So that's for gases uh, uh, like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, for carbon, it's graphite. It's the most common allotrope. So that's a way to define a free energy change. You can of course look it up by the way, they, they tend to be tabulated. And so for this balanced chemical equation, the free energy of reaction is going to be equal to the stoichiometric coefficients times the free energies of formation of all the individual species. <clears throat> and if it seems like maybe there's a little uh, knot waiting to be tied here because free energies of formation are related to the elements in their standard states, but the free energy of reaction didn't involve any of those pure allotropes or anything, Keep in mind that all those things drop away. Yes, they're relative to the elements in their pure forms, but it's a balanced chemical equation. So all the total number of elements on the product side is equal to that on the reactant side. So having reference to those elements, they cancel out. And if that sounded confusing, don't worry about it. It suffices to say that one can look up, tabulate, get free energies of reaction this way using free energies of formation. So again, let's do an example because it's helpful. So uh, now I will do a NOx example, nitrogen oxides. Um, it's a simple reaction. It's N2O4 dissociating into two nitric oxide molecules, 2NO2. And the reaction is going to proceed to some extent Xi, where Xi is going to be able to range from 0 to 1, because at 1 I run out of this. And the Gibbs energy of the reaction mixture is going to be equal to the free energy of how much N2O4 I have left plus 2 times the free energy of 1 moles worth, so I guess I'll just say the free energy of how much NO2 I've generated, which is 2 Xi. And now if I take these free energies and I express them as being standard state quantities plus RT log pressures, where hidden in there, remember, is the standard state pressure dividing this, but it's got a quantity value of one. And now, what are those pressures? Well, I know that the total quantity in the system is one minus E, one minus Xi of N2O4, plus two Xi worth of NO2. So the total amount of moles in the system is one plus Xi. And so the partial pressures will be one minus Xi over one plus Xi, and two Xi over one plus Xi times the total pressure. I'm going to do this one actually under a situation where I'll keep the total pressure externally fixed because I'm working with Gibbs free energy. So I'll set it to be a bar and I'll choose my standard states so that I use free energies of formation to define the standard state free energy of the gases. So in that case, I get that the free energy as a function of reaction extent is equal to, here's the free energy of N2O4, and here is the free energy of NO2, 
and that just follows from all, all of the above. And I can now plot, this is a fairly unimposing expression in some sense, I can look up these numbers. What's the free energy of formation of N2O4 and of NO2? And they turn out to be, whoops, I will now take you back one. They turn out to be 97.79 kilojoules per mole, 51.26 kilojoules per mole. There's nothing especially interesting about those numbers. They just are what they are. I know what RT is. So I plug all this in and I just plot free energy as a function of reaction extent. And what one finds is that at extent zero, where it's pure N2O4, that is not equilibrium. The reaction proceeds, 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 hits a minimum in the free energy. Were it to proceed any further at this temperature, 298.15 Kelvin and one bar, the free energy would go up. So it doesn't, it stops, it has come to equilibrium and it's at 0.1892 reaction extent moles that that equilibrium occurs. All right, and so uh, here's an interesting little self-assessment that we can think about. Given that G is minimized, that is, G is, it is a stationary point in G that defines equilibrium, how else could you determine C equilibrium other than measuring very carefully on that graph that I just showed? And the answer to that is one can use calculus, of course, to find a stationary point. You can differentiate this expression for G with respect to C. And for those who love doing differential calculus, you'll have your chance to explore the chain rule extensively in doing that differentiation. And when you're all done and you uh, solve for setting that equal to zero, because that's what a minimum is, uh, you'll get 0 0.1892, which is, of course, what you have to get. So as I say, this is left for the uh, calculusly eager. I, I didn't derive it here. That's the end of this video. Next, we're going to return to the reaction quotient.